Hello, everyone. Uh, whichever time zone you are, hope it's not too early or too late. Uh, my name is Raya Grimbergen. I'm from the Tokyo University of uh, Technology, and I will be your uh, session chair for session four, which is about player investigation. Um, it's almost five o'clock here in Japan, Tokyo. It's five o'clock now, so I think we will start with the first uh, presentation. Uh, the impact of wind simulation on perceived real realism of players by Zenia Burtsu, Kaya Alpan and Senol Piskin. And I think Zeynep will be uh, the presenter of this, uh, uh, this uh, research. Please, the floor is yours. Hello. Okay, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to be presenting my topic, um, which feels a little bit different from the other topics for me. And I hope you will uh, be interested in the topic uh, like me. Um, we are making a research on the modeling simulation and extended reality lab at Istinia University in Istanbul. And this is part of um, the lab's projects um, led by um, assistant professor, Dr. Shannon Fischke, my uh, advisor and professor. And I'm a doctoral researcher and lecturer in game design and uh, game studies. And my topic is actually uh, communication sciences. In this study, um, our aim was to understand the impact of in simulation on players' perceived realism in digital games. Um, game realism encompasses various dimensions besides graphics like narrative interaction, character actions, and environmental background. And um, oftentimes, game realism is centered on high visual fidelity, whereas subtle elements like wind effects contribute significantly to the immersive experience. Um, so we wanted to um, especially touch on this part, uh, this part of game realism uh, with dynamic wind simulation. So we integrated it um, into a third person shooter game and tried to assess the changes in perceived realism among players. Um, when we look at wind simulation in games, we see that it is often used to add nuanced details and enhance, uh, to enhance overall realism, like swaying vegetation or drifting snow, things like that. Um, but sometimes uh, games use wind as a main design element as well. And sometimes they are used uh, with physical wind simulation mechanisms, especially in arcades. Um, the sound design is also important in these um, wind simulation and games. And we also see that player communities express interest through making self-developed mods. Um, to explain the research, we first developed a sci-fi shooter game with wind-enabled and disabled versions, and also a based one, which doesn't involve the wind-related elements at all. And then we let our participants play the game, uh, the tutorial level, wind enabled and wind disabled versions. And then they completed the questionnaire twice, which we analyzed uh, through SPSS. And our two research questions are, does dynamically simulated wind impact players' perceived realism? And are certain elements of the scale impacted, by, impacted more by wind simulation? And if so, which items? So first, I'm going to talk about the game we developed. Um, we used the Lyra Starter game um, from uh, Epic Games, which is used with Unreal Engine 5.0. We used Unreal Engine 5.0. And we developed it as a single player game, which features AI players to um, create teams. And in the game, opposing red and blue teams fight each other in order to gain control of the control zone. 
And this gameplay is based on the control game mode inside Lyra Starter game um, by Epic. And a single play session takes between two and four minutes. Um, the game integrates dynamic wind systems, which affect fabrics, vegetation, and sound effects to simulate changing weather conditions. Um, and as I said, the tutorial level excludes wind-related elements to set a baseline for comparison. Um, our participants were university students in bachelor degree, lab visitors, and high school graduates over the age of 18. Um, participants played the tutorial level and then either A or B versions of the game. And these are with or without wind simulation. And then they completed the survey afterwards um, twice. And our analysis involved uh, comparing overall mean scores and also individual items uh, by using Wilcoxon signed ranks test. And um, we used uh, the perceived game realism scale by Ribbons et al. And um, this version, the version that we used of the scale has 32 items related to different effects of the game, um, such as agency, Play, player behavior, visual fidelity and sound effects, um, player experience, and the role of the developers. And um, the names of the dimensions are in the slide. Um, simulational realism, freedom of choice, perceptual pervasiveness, uh, and so on. Um, to explain our results, um, we had 35 participants, um, which is kind of small, um, but we will also continue with uh, other studies with the, after this one. Um, the ages were ranging from 18 to 41, with a mean of uh, 23 years um, old. And um, the agenda, uh, uh, about the gender, 13 were female, 22 were male. And their gameplay habits show that they play shooting games around once a month uh, to once a week. And they play digital games in general approximately once a week to some of them almost daily. Um, and the comparison between wind-enabled and disabled versions suggests slightly higher average ratings for the wind-enabled version, which I'm going to talk about a little more. And there were significant differences between um, versions in some specific items also. So here uh, I am showing the results for the overall and also for some of the individual items. Um, and when we compared the overall mean scores, there was a significant difference. And also with individual items, there were significant different with four items, which are by playing this game, I can learn how to play in real life. I felt I determined the course of the game. The sound effects in the game were impressive. And the final one was the developers of the game have examined which objects fit in, within the context of the game. So all of these four items are from different dimensions of the scale. Um, to summarize and finalize, uh, this research, um, while the study sample size was um, small um, and this results in some limitations, it does provide some meaningful statistic, some statistically meaningful um, results. And the findings support the impact of wind simulation on perceived realism, highlighting nuanced differences in specific items rather than correlating with established dimensions of the scale. And this um, indicates a varied influence of wind simulation on different aspects of player experience. Um, so in conclusion, this study tried to shed light on the importance of subtle ele environmental elements like wind simulation to enhance game realism. Um, and uh, in the future studies, we will try to understand the impact of physical wind simulation by using a the custom fan system that works together with the game. And also we will try to use um, simpler game designs. Um, and the first one we will use is an endless runner game, for example. Um, right now we started working on the second phase of the project. 
with the endless runner game um, to understand Wynn's role in game realism. Thank you for listening and I am waiting for your wonderful question. Um, my name is Zeynep Burcu and uh, you can reach me from my LinkedIn or my email account that I put here. Um, should I stop the sharing? Well, I think you can leave it on. If there are any okay. questions to specific parts of the of the presentation, that uh, that's easy to show then. So, uh, well, we have uh, quite quite some time for questions, comments. Uh, anyone? Um, it does cost a lot of <laughs> resources. Um, but we tried to optimize it with like using uh, a specific um, particle simulation. So for the particle simulation, it didn't cost much. And because our um, graphics card is taking the hard uh, hit, uh, the cloud simulation also didn't um, make so much trouble. Um, but we have to test with low performance um, computers to see how much it really costs. So in the lab computers, it wasn't a trouble. And because we won't be publishing it as a game to play um, as an end product, it wasn't much of an issue for us. OK, so the, one, one, one thing about the questions in the chat, uh, please uh, do them to everyone. Uh, Ingo just uh, asked questions to host and panelists which means that only a limited number of people can see them. So I the didn't notice was, that at first. Oh, sorry. The yeah. question was, how much computing resources does wind simulation cost in our example game? And um, overall, the technology is allowing more and more uh, of these particle effects and simulations being able to um, incorporate it in like console games, um, even in mobile games. Okay, thank you. Any um, other questions? Yes, there is also a question uh, the Q&A. Did I miss one? To what extent the experiments distinguish between wind as essentially decorative or being an important part of the game mechanic? Um, in the game we used, because of our research design, we had to do a wind-enabled and a wind-disabled versions. So in our wind disabled versions, the game had to work as well as um, the other one. So we couldn't use um, use it as an important part of the game, like the boat sailing at different speeds um, and like it affecting game mechanisms um, because we had to make sure that it doesn't affect the game mechanism. So it was basically uh, about the decorative uh, parts so it wasn't, uh, we didn't investigate how it affects like important um, as an important game element. So we only um, did the experiment as a environmental, like small thing. This morning we had a, uh, a presentation on features, yes? And that was an, uh, an interesting presentation. And uh, during your presentation, I was thinking to myself, what features do we speak about and which features do we combine and when is it successful? Because uh, I, law I saw in the question by Dave Gombach, welcome Dave, good to see you again, uh, that an important portion of the game was mechanics. And, and then he gives some uh, some things. That's true, but also there is some strategy on the uh, on the games and on the on the wind. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, for us, wind was only a decorative element, as um, they said, um, because we had to make sure that the game worked with like um, none of the wind um, elements working, so it didn't affect any game mechanisms. Uh, like wind didn't affect anything actually. Um, 
But I think one important thing about the features is that because the game was complex, so it has it is a shooter game, so you have to be really aware of your surroundings. If the uh, opposing team member is coming, like where is your teammate? Uh, what's the t uh, time clock? Like who is in control of what area? So you have to make sure uh, you have to be aware of all these different things uh, and come up with a strategy. Like are you going to control the zones or are you going to kill the enemies? So um, because of this, people um, were maybe more impacted by the environmental changes or less. Like, I am not sure. Um, so maybe that is an interesting point with the study because uh, a lot of the participants said that because they were concentrated so much on uh, the like, how the game works and what are we going to do? Like, what's the game game's rules? What am I doing? And some of them also weren't very used to games uh, or shooter games. Um, so they said that they didn't even realize like anything to do with wind. They didn't see any trees or they didn't see anything. Uh, but they actually the sh uh, results show that um, they were impacted by the sound design of the wind. So because the wind uh, sound that wind sound dynamically changes like uh, you know like gushing wind um, and um, they were aware of it even though they were concentrated on the features of the game like where is the enemy how am i going to defeat them uh, how do i shoot stuff like that um, so i think a difference could be um, if the game is a complex game or a very easy game um, so that's why we are going to continue with the easier game uh, design where you, you you won't have to think about too much. You will just, you know, um, hit space and jump or hit down arrow and crouch in order to continue uh, with the game. Let me assume that we have an easy game, yes, and uh, that we are happy with that. But then, of course, there are, I believe... Two uh, two parts in that. There we, we have the group of players who have, I would say, advantage of the wind, and we have players who have mm -hmm. disadvantage of the wind. Could you tell us a little bit about the reactions? Hmm. That's a difficult question, but anyway, <sighs> you could imagine that I would say uh, if you compare them and they have equal fighting, then they are, I would say, upset, of course, when you have a uh, wind against you instead of wind behind you, yes? Mm -hmm. um, well, if it's a sailing simulation, uh, it would affect things a lot. Um, for example, to remember on my own player experiences, especially in Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, when I'm, you know, paragliding against the wind, I have to change my strategy about my like where I'm trying to go. So I have to uh, make reevaluate my goals about like uh, what I'm trying to achieve in the game, um, where I'm trying to land. You know, if the uh, wind is behind me, and I can go much more further and like maybe reach the tower I'm trying to reach. But if I cannot, um, if the wind is going towards me, I would feel that. I have to change my goal and go to a closer place. Um, so maybe changing decisions could be a thing, like um, making other decisions. Um, but I don't think it's really about realism, but more about like decision-making process. That would be my guess. Okay, yeah, I believe you because I'm not in the field, so I could not say what should be my decision or whatever. But uh, I would say you can imagine, of course, that if we have uh, these two uh, specialties, I'll say wind with you and wind against you, yes, mm -hmm. then you could have also, if there is a group of 10, and you could also have difficult qualities or difficult strategies to handle that, yes? This, could you say a little bit about uh, yeah, uh, what is the differences in, I would say, in sailing with wind against you uh, among among the among the opponents? I would say mm -hmm. you have a, a set of 20 opponents, 
and they all have uh, with the gain seal, and some one are better than others, yes? And why is that the case? Mm. Well, I don't know how it's going to affect realism, so probably it's besides the hope of, like, game realism. Um, but it would be interesting to see the results. And especially with physical wind, I think it would be even more interesting because um, the uh, mechanical system we are developing right now works like behind your head. So it works like um, it's simulating wind as if it's coming behind your head. And um, it has like five different parts which are going to simulate the direction where the wind is coming. So uh, I think it would be interesting to see if like the mechanical wind coming from behind you or coming from in front of you is going to affect it at all, like the game realism. Um, but I don't know about the decision making part, actually. OK, thank you. I wish you good luck with the uh, I would say, continuation of your research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that's all we have time for, for this presentation. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to go to the next presentation, which is uh, how does again and again a study on frustration tolerance, physiology and player experience. And I think the presenter is Loritz Dixon. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, we didn't have time to test your uh, presentation, if there, if it's visible. I, at least I can hear you, so that's one one part that's okay. So okay. can you start? To, can you try the screen screen sharing? Yep. How's this? Looks like there's no problem. So very good. Let's start with your presentation, please. Okay. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Lauritz, and uh, I'm a PhD student at the Brain Lab at ITU Copenhagen, where we um, we do some physiological uh, measurements. We do player modeling, sometimes on the brain. Uh, today, I'm going to present a paper on, on frustration, so more about physiology. Um, and uh, this was a student project done by Mai, uh, who's in the audience. Uh, hello, Mai, and, uh, and my supervisor, Paolo. Um, so the outline for today is going to be, uh, very briefly, I'm going to talk about player modeling on frustration specifically, and then, uh, I'll, I'll go through the measurements that we did, uh, in this study, and then, uh, go talk a little bit about Hades, uh, the game and our results, and then at a, a, a brief discussion of them. Um, so player modeling in general is uh, the idea of trying to understand the player. And uh, and this is uh, quite an important topic, of course, in, in gaming because uh, games are interactive, meaning that just understanding the game itself uh, is sometimes not enough. We also need to understand the input to the game, which is the player. And the players can be uh, quite different, meaning that they can have different goals and uh, different motivations uh, driving them to do different things and trying to understand what what uh, drives a player and uh, what they're trying to accomplish in the game uh, is quite an important topic. Uh, this graphic I have is just uh, trying to uh, exemplify that. Um, here. Uh, so frustration. Frustration is one of these uh, quite important things in, in games that happens uh, a lot. And um, I, I like to think of it as a balance of challenge, meaning that <clears throat> uh, too much challenge can become frustration. And obviously, frustration is a very negative emotion and generally not something we want to evoke in our players. Um, on the other hand, uh, many players are driven by this challenge and, uh, and a game that is not challenging at all will will probably not be very fun or very interesting for a lot of players to play. And so uh, driving uh, this challenge so in, in the correct spot so that your player is motivated and uh, have a high engagement with your game versus uh, not evoking this frustration is, is very important. 
Um, sorry. Uh, challenge is also linked to uh, any type of learning or uh, a lot of uh, very positive things. So a, a very important part of, of gaming experience. Uh, we do see a lot of games that evoke uh, this extreme challenge, meaning that uh, maybe specifically trying to evoke frustration. Uh, I put on uh, Dark Souls 3 as an example here, but I mean, the whole Dark Souls series or many other types of games in, in this genre. I mean, there is a whole now Dark Souls-like uh, genre, I guess, which is all about evoking very extreme challenge. Uh, speaking to the fact that challenge is, is a core experience uh, or a, por a core part of, of the game experience for a lot of players. Um, and then uh, I put on this like stupid thumbnail I found on a YouTube video, which is from a game called Only Up, where you need to jump uh, on these objects floating in the air. Anytime you miss a jump, meaning you miss the object, uh, you fall all the way down and you need to start all over again. It's a very frustrating experience. It's a very frustrating game, but extremely popular, uh, which which is a, an interesting uh, interaction because obviously frustration is, is pretty negative, uh, but for a lot of people, it can also be a, a very rewarding thing if, if there is a, a high level of frustration involved in the game, uh, exemplified, I guess, by the guy here uh, showing his frustration while, while playing this game. So trying to understand frustration is, is, is pretty important when you need to understand how, how games work and, and how players interact with your game. Okay, so how do we measure this? Because obviously we want to research this and uh, uh, what type of measures can we do? And then even better, can we look at these individual differences? Meaning uh, obviously not all players are driven by this frustration. Some players prefer cozy games or more relaxing games or puzzle games, um, and these experiences, uh, these players uh, might interact or experience the game in, in, in quite a different way uh, from other players which might enjoy these uh, frustrating experiences. Okay, so how do we measure? Uh, we have three things here, uh, I guess four things, I guess. Um, but first we have subjective reporting, meaning simply we ask the player what they, what they felt during the gameplay and how they react or how they think about their own gameplay experience. Then we have some physiological measures, meaning uh, uh, some more objective uh, measures maybe that are um, maybe more free of, of bias, at least can uh, complement the, uh, the subjective reporting. And then third, we have some player profiling, meaning we can think about a personality test of some sort that can help us understand what type of player we have and then lastly, the gameplay itself, right? Like how the player is interacting with the game. Um, so let's first talk about the subjective reporting that we did in this study. Uh, we used the game experience questionnaire, the GEC, uh, which has a few uh, sub modules. One is this core, which is the player experience itself. It's just a very raw uh, experience module asking about the player, how they uh, felt during the gameplay. And then there is a post-game module, which is much more about reflection. So uh, reflecting on their own experience, reflecting on their own performance during the game. And then uh, we removed uh, the social presence and in-game modules because they were not really relevant to our experimental design. Uh, the social presence, for example, was not really relevant because it's a single game, single player game we're looking at. And, and we also didn't interrupt them during the gameplay. So the in-game module was also not relevant. Uh, and then we have a heart rate monitor, um, gives us the second to second heart rate, and we can get different types of measures from this. We can get the, uh, for example, time spent in maximum heart rate or in minimum heart rate uh, shown by, by that uh, uh, subject, or we can get the heart rate variability, uh, which is a, a fairly well-known measurement of, uh, of at least arousal and uh, arousal is a, a core component of frustration. So hopefully this will give us some sense of, of their frustration uh, elicited by their uh, body. And then we have the player personality covered by uh, these two tests, the BISPAS scale or behavioral inhibition, behavioral activation scale. And then we have the uh, FNR, 
which is the uh, frustrative non-reward responsiveness. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than this. Um, this BISPAS FNR is typically thought of as these five individual subscales. Uh, the BIS is the, uh, the uh, behavioral inhibition scale, which is the tendency to avoid negative outcomes, meaning reactiveness to punishment. And then the BAS is the opposite. It's, uh, it's responsiveness to rewards, but in, in three different ways. So there's drive, fun seeking, and then reward responsiveness. Um, and then the FNR is a, a, a typically a, an add-on to this type of uh, BISPAS uh, personality test where you look at the motivational response to the lack of reward, meaning that we, we don't consider rewards um, uh, in this scale and, and specifically in, in, in frustration. Uh, these types of scales are used um, in clinical terms, but they can also give you pretty good ideas on, on personality. Okay, so the game that we um, uh, used in this study was Hades, which is a roguelike game, meaning that death results in a full reset. So you play the game, and then when you die or you lose the game, you need to reset and, and go back to the beginning. Uh, meaning that it can be quite frustrating or, or uh, uh, hard to play. Uh, I guess the, the difficulty comes from it being pretty mechanically difficult. Uh, there is a, a lot of things happening. There is a lot of inputs. You play it with a controller. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a skillful uh, game in timing and uh, precision. And then you have these progressive rooms with tougher and tougher enemies, um, meaning there's multiple enemies at one time, often... And uh, and you 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 progress, uh, becoming more and more challenging, uh, pretty much ensuring that the player is going to experience some some hard challenge here. Um, yeah, and, uh, and of course a picture shown here. Uh, the gameplay kind of looks like this: uh, the player is is fighting a boss uh, in this picture here uh, with the low health on the bottom left, and uh, and you can see there's multiple enemies on the screen that the player needs to keep track of and dodge attacks and such. Okay, so the protocol very quickly is quite simple. Uh, first, we, the player fills out this BISPAS FNR scale. Uh, then there is 30 minutes of Hades gameplay in the hell mode, which I think is the hardest difficulty, so it's, it's, it's pretty hard. And uh, lastly, they fill out this game experience questionnaire scale. And the demographics of the participants have a mean age of 27. It was uh, mainly consistent of, of students from uh, ITU, uh, which is the university. And uh, many of them had previous experience with gaming, but not Hades specifically. Um, okay, so the hypotheses for uh, this experiment uh, are twofold. One is looking at these individual differences in frustration tolerance and the impact it could have on the player experience. Uh, so the personality of the player, how does that impact their experience with the frustrating game? And in second part, how does the individual differences in the uh, physiological responses have a relationship with the player experience? And uh, to measure these, we end up with a massive correlation uh, matrix, which is very hard to read and a bit of a mess. Um, the idea here is that every measure that we have, uh, also on performance, on the different scales, are correlated with each other. And we're trying to find patterns that either support or uh, deny the hypotheses. And instead of going through the whole thing, because that would take uh, ages, I'll go through a few individual results that I think are interesting. And then I'll talk a bit more about like the, the general ideas here, <clears throat> the general findings. Uh, the individual results, the main ones that are interesting to look at is the performance measured typically by how far the player gets in the game. Uh, so the performance of the player was uh, well correlated with the uh, game experience uh, of competence and positive experience. <clears throat> so a, a reasonably high correlation uh, in those two measures. And we also see a, a pretty good relationship between the 
meaning a, a high correlation. This is, a, I should mention, Pearson's uh, R correlation. That's the R on the, on the right side here on the screen. Um, the performance of the player and the standard deviation of the heart rate and the uh, heart rate uh, at the bottom, meaning how much time they spend on the bottom, uh, meaning that, and, and the correlation is positive uh, in the direction so that the players that were uh, performing the best had the lowest time in the bottom. A little bit hard to, to think about, uh, but I guess we can think of it as engagement. Uh, the players that were engaged had a, a, a longer time not spent at the bottom heart rate uh, was, uh, was performing better. Okay. Going back to the big correlation matrix, I think the bigger picture is that there's like, it's really hard finding patterns in this big thing. I, I know the, the text is a little bit small uh, to read here, uh, but looking at these uh, at this big matrix, uh, seeing that uh, the dark red is the positive correlations and the dark blue is the negative correlations. And we have sorted these scales uh, so that they're belonging together. The base paths are close to each other. The heart rates are close to each other. Uh, all of them are, are uh, grouped up. And what we can see is that there is really no pattern immersion in these things. Uh, it's really hard to find a consistent pattern here, which I think is, is the main finding that we have here is that especially on the, on the personality test, it was really hard finding any consistent results uh, in any of the other scales, meaning that, well, I mean, uh, the kind of thing you do when you find neutral results or negative results in your uh, hypothesis is that obviously it could be an experimental design. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's more the, on the fact that it's it's a it's a bit more complicated the relationships, at least that you can find in in twenty subjects. I don't think this BISPAS FNR scale is really comprehensive enough to capture these differences in a way that uh, that it would show up uh, in, in these type of measures. Uh, otherwise, or at least we need to, to look at other things as well to, to fully understand it. Uh, I don't think there is a, a very clear pattern emerging uh, from the results that we have here. Um, yeah, and that's actually all I have for the results in this question uh, today. I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I have a few links to our contacts and uh, there's a GitHub with all the data and uh, all the all the different types of analyses that we did uh, that, that so you can replicate and, and, and see it for yourself. Thank you. Okay, that was exactly 15 minutes. Brilliant. Nice. Uh, there, are all, all, there are already some questions in the Q&A. Can you see them? Uh, let me go look. Okay. Um, okay, so the first one, I guess, is uh, a difference in designing frustration about video games and board games. I think that's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting idea. Um, so obviously, Hades is a single player game, meaning that the type of frustration we were thinking about was this mechanical difficulty or uh, the punishment of the gameplay itself. And when I think of, of board games, at least, I think mostly of a social experience. And um, and maybe it's it's a quite different type of, uh, of frustration, which I think is, is super interesting. I'm not an expert on, on board games, but that's uh, but I would imagine that there would be some some difference between single player experiences and uh, and multiplayer. Um, whereas when you're sitting in front of a screen, you're typically alone in your experience, uh, at least in, in the single player here. Um, and I imagine that would have some effect, which I'm not exactly sure, but uh, yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, the next one is, are there some specific, oh, uh, one, uh, okay. Are there some specific game dynamics that tend to increase or decrease frustration? Okay, um, I mean, we tried, uh, picking a game that was difficult, right? So I, I talked a little bit about the, the particular um, uh, features of Hades that we thought were, were frustrating. I think, I think Mai, who picked the game, specifically picked this game because she found it very frustrating to play, while her boyfriend did not find it very frustrating or found it very fun 
in this way. Um, I think this like permadeath, for example, uh, it, it being a, a quite punishing dynamic, right? Like uh, uh, you, you make one of you or a few mistakes and that sets you very far back, meaning you expect very high consistent performance on your players. I think that's a game dynamic that's very uh, prone to eliciting frustration. Uh, and then I think the mechanical difficulty, I don't think matters very much. It, it could be any type, any other type of difficulty uh, uh, in, in, in my mind, uh, as long as it's, it is somewhat difficult. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, and that's also answering the last question here, what led us to, to pick Hades. I think this like, I, I think something that's difficult and also uh, requires very high consistent performance on the player is 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 uh, prone to um, elicit frustration. And it, so this goes back to the beginning, where also where I said the frustration and and a lot of game design comes to a, a balance of challenge, where you need to uh, keep the player engaged in your game in such a way that it's challenging enough to keep playing, uh, but you also don't want to. Uh, tip into full frustration, uh, at, at least uh, by default. Uh, I mean, as as I also talked about, there is some interesting relationships where you have like these uh, very popular games that are uh, pretty frustrating and pretty hard to play. Okay, I think that covers the Q and A's uh, that I can see here. Are there any other questions, comments? The first question there was also a comment. Okay. Uh, in the chat or? Yeah, in the chat, yeah. What what did you lead to uh, to your choice? Uh, on the uh, on the cho on the choice of game or. Okay, one side common, famous chat. Well, anyway, <laughs> to right, translate okay. her question, to translate her question uh, into my words, yes, you give an, uh, a proper answer in my uh, saying, but anyway, what are the motives that you give that answer? So what are your underlying ideas? Uh, sorry, in, in relationship to what? An underlying in relationship to... To the first question. Which was exactly? By Mr. Asa Koskinen, yes? Uh, what about investigating switches? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe this, uh, okay. Uh, investigating switches between periods of frustration and success. I think that's, uh, I think that's super interesting. I think there is like this negative positive dynamic that is, uh, that's um, definitely happening where uh, the, the, the lower the lows, the higher the highs. Uh, and I think maybe this goes back to the idea also of the heart rate sensor uh, that we are measuring really uh, arousal and not so much frustration itself. And so arousal, it could be either in a positive way or in a negative way. And I think uh, especially the, this dynamic between uh, uh, high emotions, uh, whether it being positive or negative is is super interesting, uh, and and this also goes back to this uh, uh, the story of the of the chess arbiter uh, that says like uh, hours of boredom and then a few minutes of of high frustration uh, high action. I think that's super interesting. And then then the question is of course, uh, assume you met somebody uh, who has a high uh, level of low well, high frustration and you are his coach or her coach. What is your approach? Yes, yes, exactly. I think, yeah, I, I think that's that. It's exactly the type of questions uh, that that is interesting. I obviously our research. Uh, I don't think this bis best if an R scale. I think if if the research, our results here show that this bis best scale doesn't cover it. At least uh, this tolerance to frustration uh, is it, not covered by this exactly. Um, Maybe it's yeah, hard yeah. to evaluate yourself on it. 
Uh, yes, <laughs> everybody who is here, a scientist or a sporter, they all have frustrations. You can uh, you can accept that from me, this statement. And the, the question now is, if you are an educator of such a sporter or such a, a scientist, yes, what is the best way, let's say you are a supervisor for a PhD student, yeah, what is the best way to handle that frustration? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, with this very difficult question, we will have to end this session. I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> Dude, sorry to give um, you some homework. Well, well, it's the end of day two, so I guess we can talk for another 23 hours or something until the next uh, <laughs> day starts. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to end this at uh, uh, 40 minutes, and it's already uh, 44 minutes into this session. So thank you very much. Thank you to both speakers in the session. It was very interesting. Um, yeah, I'll have to be honest. I also have some questions, but uh, I will have to do this uh, on a you know, on a different time. Uh, maybe I'm uh, I'm very interested in frustration. So, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing this question, this session very adequately. Thank you very much. <laughs>